we've just been hugely stress tested here, right, with this bond deal tantrum, and sort of markets sort of survived. We are looking not just at the peaks, right? We are looking at the sustainability of these trends. Where policy stance is today needs to be seen through, but absolutely, there are some tough decisions ahead. What the bond market is telling you right now is not so fast. Fed has the upper hand. We still have the long-term structural forces that weigh against significant acceleration and growth. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. From New York City for our audience worldwide, good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Tom Keen and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. We were going to start the morning in Frankfurt. We've got to start it in Zurich, Switzerland. Tom Keen, Credit Suisse down another five, six percentage points. A busy day, but I think you're right, John. You go right to the common stock and the analysis of it. I think the coverage has been very weak, to be honest, and that this is about share dilution. When in doubt, nail the present shareholders. Eliza Martinuzzi has a uh, calculation on the street of a 7% share dilution. The reality of that, John, is stunning. Raising $2 billion and taking another 600 million Swiss hit maybe in this quarter as well, Tom. JP Morgan, the analyst coming out and saying the following. Capital has mainly been addressed. The questions remaining, strategy, risk management. I don't risk buy it, John. I just Tom, don't buy it. we had the answers to that? John, I don't buy it. Strategy is out the window. You are taking it, you're taking to the, sh the common shareholders, to the cleaners, and they on an emergency basis have to adjust this bank and stop the share price decline. Do you think you've heard enough? Have you had enough clarity, transparency over the last couple of weeks from this bank? I, I, I don't know. This has been going on for years with Credit Suisse. I think, you know, Francine is expert on this with her uh, many interviews with the previous management and the present uh, management. I thought he was basically led in this morning. And the bottom line is, what does this bank do? They go back 1856. They funded that magnificent rail system of Switzerland. And they become, the you know, are they the weakest of the bulge bracket banks? Well, right now, yes, because they're in trouble. Every time there's a problem in Europe, they're at the epicenter of it. Tijan Tiam Credit Suisse is CEO in a former year, a former part of his tenure, was talking about de-risking the bank, Lisa. De-risking the bank. And clearly they weren't successful at doing that. No, and they are saying that they are going to de-risk further, in particular in their prime brokerage account, uh, reducing the amount of leverage that they extend. And I got to say, I wonder how much that's contributing to a little bit of softness in markets as banks around the world consider doing the same. I will say, though, to your question, John, has transparency been enough? A lot of questions about where the losses stemmed from, why Credit Suisse did not exit the positions earlier, and how it could be that they still have some positions still on their books. And the answers were not clear. Credit Suisse's executive management saying that if we had exited earlier, it wouldn't have stemmed the losses that much. How could that be, John? What's the explanation then? And will Thomas Godstein actually achieve what? Tijan Tiam tried to. Look, the reporting coming from Sri Natarajan in the last week or so has been amazing here at Bloomberg, Tom. Credit Suisse executives had given the point salesman to Archegos on its swaps desk the new responsibility of instead overseeing risk taking in the broader prime brokerage unit, according to people with well, knowledge of the matter. Uh, what happened here is still something I don't think we've had a decent explanation on. And the distinction here, John, is other banks, maybe they made the same decision and it was a wrong decision to back this family fund slash hedge fund slash massively leveraged institution. But they got out of it, and then other banks had the decision not even to participate. And I, I don't. I see zero contrition. I see almost an MBA numbness of consulting as they try to manage their way out of this debacle. But as you point out, Tom, this goes way before Thomas Godstein. I, I would suggest this is that. Tijan Tiam. I remember going over to Credit <clears throat> Suisse in the early part of the last decade, catching up with Brady Dugan and talking about the strategy then as well. We've been talking about this for a long, yeah, long time. I, what does this bank look like? I'm glad you mentioned Mr. Dugan there as well. You know, I'm not going to take it back to their acquisition of Donaldson, Lufkin, Generet of, of years ago or even the first Boston acquisition of 1978. But this is a bank that's just stumbled forward. And again, you see it this morning with the ultimate answer. they got to build up tier one capital so they do a 7% share dilution. Stock's down 6%. Got to do a couple of things this morning, Tom. Credit Suisse, one of them. ECB I wore my ECB tie. A little bit later. It looks good on radio. Thanks for you that. You like it, John? Thank you. It looks fantastic. Madame Lagarde selected it this for me long ago and far away. Brilliant. Lisa, there are two of the things we've got to do. We've got to talk about Earth Day as well. The president set to announce a new target for the United States to achieve a 50 to 52 percent reduction from 2005 levels in economy-wide net greenhouse gas pollution in 2030. 
a renewed effort from this administration, from this country, from the federal government, Lisa, on this Earth Day. Yeah, and a renewed effort also to lead in this front, and that is a key question. How will the U.S. lead on this front following the Trump presidency? Interesting to see also what teeth Biden puts behind some of these assertions. How much money are they going to put behind this? How much money can they put behind this if you don't have bipartisan support for some sort of green deal or financing such uh, going forward? Three big stories for us through this Thursday morning. Let's get to the price action for you. Tom Keen fired up this morning. <laughs> Equity futures down around about a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. Yields unchanged at 156 on US 10s. In the FX market, euro dollar 120.46 up around about a tenth of 1%. Just a little bit of euro strength, Lisa, going into the ECB meeting a little bit later this morning. Yeah, a lot of uncertainty, though. 7.45 a.m. We get that ECB rate decision followed at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time by Christine Lagarde's press conference. The key question will be, after June, what happens? The ECB has been accelerating their bond purchases. Will they continue to do so after June? What are their inflation targets? How much inflation will they tolerate? And what bonds will they be buying? These are all some of the questions that Christine Lagarde will be facing amid a rather, I don't know, I don't want to say split, but you'll hear different things from different arms of the ECB body, which perhaps is a bit of a problem. I'm John. I'm sure you'll get to that. ADM, President Biden is going to kick off this two-day climate summit that's being held virtually. We already talked about the idea that the U.S. is going to be uh, aiming to cut their emissions in half by the end of 2030. Key question is how much momentum can he generate and how much credibility can he uh, engender given what kind of financing the U.S. can promise behind this. And then at 8.30 a.m., U.S. initial jobless claims. This has been really noisy data. And I wonder at this point whether this is even useful data. And yet we are expecting well. to see an increase in the number of initial jobless claims this week uh, from an already elevated level, albeit way down from the peak of the yeah. pandemic. The key question is what information can we glean from data that is highly messy and suspect? At the same time, is there a sense of how much services employment is being brought online, how much we are seeing uh, some sort of easing in the strains in employment? Go on, Tom. No, I just think it's really important. George Cervellas with a brilliant note this morning, making very clear Canada's different than U.S. Canada's generating jobs, John. We are not. It's not about restaurant jobs. It's getting the labor economy back on track. Cervellas says it's not happening in the U.S. What's interesting about this statement coming out of the administration, these gas pollution reduction targets, the greenhouse gas pollution reduction targets, Tom, aimed at creating good-paying union jobs, securing U.S. Well, leadership on clean you get energy technologies. Precisely. That is at the top of the fact sheet released from this administration. Top of the pile. Let's bring in Russ Kostrick, shall we? BlackRock Global Allocation Fund Portfolio Manager. Russ, I want to go straight to this market. Been really choppy over the last month or so. You've been at the epicenter of it, together with Rick Reader, saying we trimmed up on some of the risk-taking. Are you still maintaining that position? We are, Jonathan. Good morning. So we are still overweight stocks. We have brought down our risk a bit. And, you know, again, nothing uh, too surprising there. It's been a huge run. We continue to expect very strong economic data. But there are also some other issues. And clearly the market is going to have to navigate uh, this transition from incredible monetary accommodation to thinking about what removing some of that accommodation is ultimately going to look like. And while I don't think we're looking at a full-blown taper tantrum, you know, as we saw back in late February and March, if we see these spikes in bond market volatility, it does have at least a temporary effect on how equities are trading. You know, I, I look, Russ, where we are, and everybody's trying to reset right now. We're resetting ourselves into a boom economy. What have you changed in the last two weeks in your mindset? You know, in the last two weeks, we haven't changed that much. Uh, you know, as I said, we have trimmed a little bit of equity risk out of the portfolio. But if you look at the basic structure, it's more or less the way it's been the last several months. We're still very underweight duration. We expect rates to move higher. Uh, it is hard to reconcile negative 70 bips on real 10-year yields with an economy that's likely to grow 7, 8, 9, 10 percent. Pick your number in the coming quarters. We're still leaning into cyclical exposure. We're still overweight the U.S. We're still overweight Europe because, again, we like a lot of the cyclicals there. So, again, other than bringing down the beta a bit, uh, no radical changes in the portfolio. What are you looking for, Russ, to get back involved in risk more, more aggressively? Well, you know, again, at least to be clear, you know, we are still overweight stocks. And I think, you know, we, we have a position in the portfolio that if markets continue to move higher, and again, our base case is at the end of the year, stocks will be higher than they are today, you know, we're going to participate. On the other hand, you know, we do think that markets have moved a lot, and you're probably going to get some better entry points for some of the names we like, 
up than we have today. So, for example, you know, one of the things we're looking at is stocks are showing an increasing tendency to reverse. And what do I mean by that? If you have a big up move one day, you tend to be followed in the coming days by a down move and vice versa. Can you take advantage of that? You know, can you take advantage of this day to day churn you're seeing in the market to get into positions, get into some long term themes that we'd like at a better price? Russ, it's good to hear from you, sir. As always, sure. delicate moment. <clears throat> Russ Kostrick of BlackRock. A little bit of volatility out there. Some uncertainty. I think it was Chris Verone in the last couple of days, Tom, who said yes. we just lack a narrative right now. We lack a narrative right now. He wants to sit this one out a little he, bit. He released that yesterday, and you're dead on, John. The Verone shift here of, of really getting a little more hesitant is interesting. One of the themes I'm hearing here from the Buy the Dip crew, John, is they're looking at this as your chosen opportunity. When do you have the courage to go in to buy the dip? I'm sure we'll hear that from Dwyer. Who wins the quarter? Sarah Velos over at Deutsche Bank speaking to the team in the early part of Bloomberg surveillance this morning, Lisa, saying Q1, that was won by the United States. Q2, he thinks that's won by Europe. And that certainly is being increasingly priced in, albeit on the margins, when you see the euro gaining against the dollar. That perhaps is the bet, this belief that there is going to be bigger upside surprises. I got to say, though, the increasing conundrum in markets right now is rates. And there was sort of a consensus heading into this year that rates would go up. Now it's getting more split. This idea of transitory really catching up with markets kind of signing on to that, John. Price sets narrative, doesn't it, Lisa? Nothing really changes. <laughs> pretty much. Nothing that could really be changes. It. What's changed right now apart from the price in the last month? That's about it, really, isn't it? We actually got confirming data, and people yeah. sort of shrug it off and say no, transitory. John, we can just basically John. look past this. Go on, TK. Excuse me, transitory. Hold on. You having a drink? I did that for you. you having a longer drink? You've got something to say? No, I'll get to the longer drink in a moment. What's transitory, John, is Gareth started yesterday. Gareth started. Gareth, Gareth started. The did, did the Tots well. win? The, the Tots came back and there won we go. to save. Is their... that why you're in such a good mood this morning? I, I'm in a good mood. I, you know, it's fascinating here, John. I, you know, we don't have time right now for this, but I'm fascinated how J.P. Morgan comes out of this soccer debacle. Yeah, and many people I, are, I, Tom. I just, many I, people are. Amazing. Yeah, I agree with you. Coming up in the next stat, turning to our Canaccord Genuity Chief Market Strategist. John, Equities bounced back yesterday. Please. Equities down three, off by a tenth of 1%. TK, just for you, so you can have another drink. Just drink anyway. Transitory. Thank you. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>
this is fundamentally an issue becoming an issue of competitiveness of economic competitiveness the firms that uh, that are innovating that are lower carbon that are part of the solution uh, and the financial institutions that are getting behind those solutions are doing very well they will do much much better uh, this is where the world's headed the question is pace really great to catch up with mark carney the former bank of england governor and u.n special envoy for climate action and finance from new york city this morning good morning <laughs> alongside tom Keane, lisa abravitz i'm jonathan ferro this thursday morning an ecp rate decision just around a corner a news conference with christine lagarde as well and claims in america going into that equity future shaping up as follows on the s p 500 slightly negative on the s p we're down three and off by a tenth of one percent in the bond market yields high by almost the basis point to 156.27 euro dollar maintaining that 120 handle at 120.54 credit suisse in zurich switzerland down by more more than 6% off by 6.29% as they come out look at another 600 million hit <coughs> off the back of the Archegos chaos and and have to raise 2 billion on top of that. Tom, that's the story out of Zurich. Let's talk about the story here in the United States on this Earth Day. Bank of America producing some research early on this morning. It pays to be green. We see higher multiples for low emissions, net zero targets and water efficiency yeah. as well. Investors are on top of this in a much bigger way in the last couple of years. A little perspective, John. I unfortunately remember the first Earth Day. I was a senior in high school. Good morning all in Fairport, uh, New York. And it was a joke. The first Earth Day was like, really, you've got to be kidding me, except the air pollution of this nation, John, is dramatically better than it ever was. I, like so many, use yep. Los Angeles as the litmus paper. I remember unable to see the San Gabriel Mountains, unable to breathe in Altadena and Pasadena a million years ago. And it is better right now. Jack Fitzpatrick knows that as well, uh, running our government, uh, reporting in uh, Washington. Jack Fitzpatrick, good morning to you. Can the president legislate climate change? Is this a PR or an executive or a get reelected or ha make the international community happy exercise? Or can we actually legislate climate change in your Washington? Legislating climate change is the hardest part of addressing climate change, but based on what we've seen from Biden so far, it does look like he's going to put in a, a lot of effort into legislating it rather than doing things entirely on his own. If you look at what he proposed in the infrastructure plan in terms of <clears throat> things like electrifying the federal fleet, electric car infrastructure, but also uh, about $400 billion in tax incentives for clean energy, that's, uh, that's a lot Lot different than what Obama did, relying very heavily on the clean power plan and things that the executive branch tried to do on its own. Uh, that doesn't mean he won't go on his own, and it doesn't mean he's necessarily destined for success working with Congress, but he is uh, trying to legislate a lot more on this than we've seen from past administrations. Jack, I'll choose my words really carefully because corporations are doing their own thing. Cities are doing their own thing. Is the federal government the place where we have an issue in this country right now? Is that where we have a credibility problem? Yes. Uh, if, if you talk to climate activists, uh, even just Democrats who want something to happen on climate change, uh, there's been a lot of action from cities. There's been a lot of action in the, the private sector. Uh, but the federal government has been the one that's really, really slow to move uh, in its part on the big, broad parts of this, uh, the regulatory side of the electric sector uh, and the infrastructure side on the transportation sector. Uh, and you can see why politically uh, it's been slow to happen. But if, if it's tied into an infrastructure package that could be bipartisan, maybe uh, there's movement there. But, but yes, the federal government has been really slow on this. Well, let's talk about what's top of the pile in this press release from the administration this morning, Jack. Good paying union jobs, U.S. leadership. Buy America is also in this press release too, Jack. How important are those issues at the moment? Those are exactly how uh, the Biden administration is going to frame this. I mean, they have TV ads talking about getting America to work on these climate proposals. And there is a lot of spending. There is a lot of infrastructure-related focus on what, it, what they've laid out uh, for their climate plans. The issue for them is that could be separated uh, from whatever they want to pass. Republicans are saying, why don't we do an infrastructure package? 
roads and bridges, but take out all of this climate related stuff. We can pay for it with user fees. Um, the, the, the message doesn't necessarily sell itself. And that is exactly where the pushback is coming from Republicans in Washington. And there's also a conflict between how the current administration sells a climate plan to Republicans to a bipartisan uh, committee of Congress members versus to the world. And this is sort of the conundrum. I mean, if you have sort of an America first, this is going to bring a jobs back here kind of approach. How can the U.S. lead globally and say that this is good for everybody? Well, it, you know, in that sense, it may not, it, the way they sell it publicly and the way they sell it to Republicans may not necessarily be different. The spending and building infrastructure approach, as I said, is a more uh, bipartisan approach than focusing really heavily on uh, regulatory aspects in the electric sector. Uh, you know, you, you can build and create jobs, but you can also uh, sort of use the stick rather than the carrot. The Biden uh, administration is focusing on a combination of both. Uh, the question is, can they sell it to Republicans? And in some cases, they seem to have had some positive talks on uh, how to pay for electric car infrastructure, the charging stations, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it is still a challenge, clearly. Jack, it's great to catch up, sir, and good to see you. Important day. Jack Fitzpatrick there, Bloomberg government reporter. Lisa, I think you took us to the right topic. It's how this is sold abroad, if this is going to be sold domestically as a domestic issue, a Buy America, Hire America issue. Think about who's at this summit today. Xi, Putin, Bolsonaro. <laughs> Biden as well. They've all got to agree on something like this. That's going to be Good tough. Luck. Right. I mean, you think it's hard getting Congress together in Washington, D.C., try to get this crew together and agree on some sort of climate uh, proposal. The issue here, too, is that the economy globally is struggling. The U.S. is actually better than the vast majority. So, you know, these countries have to think about how they could shore up their own economies. How does the Biden administration say it's good for them, too, even though it disproportionately benefits the U.S. with job creation? Internationally, Tom, the stage is pretty fraught right now. And I think there were some well, people out there in the last couple of months suggesting that perhaps countries like China, the Chinese Communist Party, would use this as a bargaining chip to get this administration to back off on other issues. Well, there's no question the other issues matter, including the unraveling pandemic. Just in the last 72 hours, John, the oh, pandemic India. is terrible. Tom. What I would go back to is a re-listen of Mark Carney yesterday. He was on fire about how this is not going to be solved at the federal level. It's going to start at the local and at the business level, and that will continue to drive forward the debate. I couldn't agree more, which is why I framed the question the way I did, Tom. This is a federal government that has the credibility issue, not cities, not corporations. Companies, Tom, are well ahead of this already, and they have been for the last several years. Well, yeah, they're well ahead of it. You know, we go back to the Paris Accord and what we'll see out of that uh, as well. Full disclosure, Bloomberg Philanthropies folks has been a, a huge supporter of that. But, John, I would go back to the immediacy of President Biden and how does he address this today, particularly with Xi of China? He will speak a little bit later this morning. Coming up, Frances Donald, Manulife Investment Management Global Chief Economist. We'll talk to her about the economy and this market. Equity futures, 4160 down four, a negative a tenth of 1%. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. From New York City, for our audience worldwide, live on Bloomberg Television, here is the price action this Thursday morning. Equity futures down around about four on the S&P 500, slightly negative by about a tenth of 1%. The Russell off by a third. This after a nice ramp into the close in yesterday's session. We pulled back just a little bit, going into claims a little bit later this morning. Looking for something a little north of 600,000. Hopefully, we get something better than that. If we switch up the board and get to the bond market, twos, tens, thirties, what am I looking domestically in the United States? What am I looking at? I'm looking at vaccination and the rate of vaccinations in this country start to roll over a little bit. Just start to slow down. We'll touch on that a little bit more a little bit later in the program. Yields this morning higher by about a basis point on a 10-year to about 156.44. Call it 226 on 30s. The first quarter was America's quarter. That's the line from Deutsche Bank and George Saravelos on Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition with Francine Lacroix a little bit earlier this morning. His call is Q2 will be Europe's quarter. So switch up the board and get to euro dollar. He's looking for a move towards 125. Right now, 120.51. Your euro, 
just slightly weaker year to date by a little more than 1%, but it's the inflection, Tom, over the last week or so, last couple of weeks, as we reclaim a 120 handle off the back of better than expected vaccination progress. We're seeing it in Europe, maybe a little bit convergence between Europe and the United States. Tom, unfortunately, we are not seeing that in Brazil, and we are certainly not seeing that in India right now either. Well, we are, and I'm glad you bring it up, and I'm glad you bring up George Cervelos as well, as there are a lot of different moving parts. We're going to try and coalesce them now into a really, really important conversation on the American labor economy. Francis Donald, you are expert at this. Thank you for joining from Manulife this morning. And I want to really dovetail George Cervelos' note early this morning. Cervelos is in foreign exchange. He's looking at strong Canadian dollar. Francis, you live and breathe this with Manulife of Montreal, so we've got a wonderful wonderful nexus here of George Cerevelos and Francis Donald on the Canadian-U.S. difference. And the answer, Francis, according to George, is Canada's creating jobs and Christian Friedland and Trudeau have a nation getting back to real labor excellence faster than America. How long is it going to take for America to stop replacing restaurant jobs and get back to actual true job formation? There's about six questions in that, Tom. But I tried. I was going for seven. I failed. <laughs> uh, let's start with what we can learn from Canada. Canada is telling us a couple of really important stories. One is that relative fiscal policy is a key global market driver. That's true between Canada and the U.S., yep. but also the U.S. and Europe. The second is that labor market healing is going to be a key component to our 2021 and 2022 forecasts. And places like Canada and Europe did not experience the same drop in labor force participation rates. What matters for the United States now, for me, the most important known unknown is how fast labor supply comes back to America because that's the key to wages, that's the key to unlocking 2022 and 2023 growth. Now, last but not least, when we look at these two economies, we do see an important story, which is the U.S. really Q1 story. I love that. A lot of very good news priced into the U.S. story. I talk about re peak reopening in the U.S., peak right. reflation in the U.S. Where are expectations really low? Where are the hawkish up surprises? Where are the upside surprises <clears throat> outside the U.S. in places like Europe and Canada? My view is the next big move higher in U.S. Treasury yields is not right. going to be U.S. driven. It's going to be globally driven, probably Europe. Okay, but Francis, let's go all Marshallian here, folks. This is Alfred Marshall, supply and demand. You know, the little XEX thing that Francis is expert at. Is this about labor supply coming on, or is it about labor demand in America? It's going to be both. And this is one of the biggest challenges, is that we have this whole list of missing inputs into our outlook. And they range from things like, what are corporate taxes going to be? What does the infrastructure plan look like? What about the double mutant variant? Apparently, we have to incorporate this now into our outlook. We do not know how fast labor is going to come back, demand or supply, because we've never lived this before. So you hear high conviction economists and strategists who say, we're fully healed, we're back to full-time employment or full employment by 2022. We just don't know. We don't have the example. Yeah. And critically, on top of this, the Federal Reserve has told us they're not just looking for full employment by our traditional metrics, but a broad-based and inclusive employment goal. So even though we're still running, we're trying to figure out what we're doing, the goalposts are also moving at the same time. It makes for a complicated forecast, and I really think we need to be thinking about wide confidence intervals as we go through the next few months. Yeah, John, I like that word complicated and that it's a nation moving in fits and starts. It's a complicated issue for the airlines, too. And talking of fits and starts, domestically, things have really picked up in America for travel. Internationally, not the story. So here's an airline with a domestic tilt. Southwest coming out and saying they're hopeful to achieve break-even by June. The first quarter adjusted loss coming in at around about 172. The estimated loss, 185. 172, the number, the estimate, 185. Hopeful to achieve break-even by June. Lisa, here's an airline with a domestic till. A little bit later this morning, I believe we get an American Airlines earnings as well. There's an airline with an international till. Yeah, and when you look at the overall picture, IATA, the International Association for Airlines, came out yesterday and actually said that the net loss would be substantially bigger, $10 billion bigger this year than they had previously expected, John, because of the variance, because of the prolonged nature of this pandemic, which just isn't exactly going away. I want to use that term that Tom used, fits and starts. Francis, this will come in waves. The reopening won't happen all at once. What does that mean for you just as a market participant as well? 
Well, the complicated element of this is when you're an economist sitting in an investment team, you have to say what's going to happen to the economy, and then importantly, how much of that is already priced. A lot of good news in this price right now. So when I hear headlines like IATA saying, actually, we're going to be a little bit less than expected, this is what worries me. The scope for downside surprises in the United States is bigger. But more problematically, I hear a lot of people saying, you know, I'm very bullish the economy because I got on a flight to Florida and it was packed. The question for you is, is it still going to be packed in 2022 and 2023? You're going to notice a lot of economists are talking now about boom busts, the short cycle. A lot of forecasts are showing a sizable drop in growth for 2023. Now, that might seem very far off, but that's your fiscal impulse coming off. So fits and starts over the next three to six months, absolutely, we're going to have to trade those. It's going to be a very tactical, range-bound market. But where my eye is, is the strategic fits and starts, which is, do we see in the United States a pull forward of demand that's very aggressive for one to two years? And then are we facing a little bit more of a problem in the back half of these five-year forecast periods? So you wear two hats. So let me just address that question a little bit more specifically. When you say the scope for downside surprise, more scope for downside surprises in America as a economist or as a market participant? Oh, as both. The problem, however, is that we're looking at a market. And even though I can say we've seen peak reflation, peak reopening in the United States, I cannot be short equities in this market. I absolutely you know, don't want to be long bonds, particularly after this move, even if there's a little bit more upside. Rates are still incredibly low. If you want to make your return profile, you have to be allocating to equities, particularly with momentum still in your favor and the low rate environment. So now is the time with your sector rotations to be adding internationally, to be focusing on country risk and country plays. That's the way we're going to make money in the next six months, as opposed to trying to make these calls on broad risk or headline SPX. Meanwhile, Francis, this is Earth Day, and I'm wondering how much you're paying attention to some of these proposals from an investment perspective, especially as President Biden puts money behind it. Absolutely every single day. I'm often asked, what's the biggest delta on your forecast, biggest change on your forecast, the transition from the Trump administration to the Biden administration? It's actually green spending. Now, importantly, when we talk about fiscal spending, people usually say this amount, billions of dollars and trillions of dollars equals this amount of growth. But how it's spent is what determines the fiscal multipliers. Green spending is going to have a longer horizon with a different fiscal multiplier. The other component of that that's really critical is we watch green bond issuance as another big component of future asset allocation. A lot of thirst for that. So incorporating ESG investing, looking at green spending, key component of the economic outlook, but also the investment pro, uh, portfolio construction. Francis, I want to dovetail this idea of a green initiative with where we began this conversation, and that is jobs and wages. And we have uh, Biden coming out and saying that this will actually generate well-paying jobs, but you've got union groups pushing back and saying that solar and wind uh, companies have been really opposed unionization and opposed efforts to try to bring wages up in that way. What's the truth? Oh, uh, the complicated element of this is all forms of infrastructure spending, from green to highways. The IMF has plenty of work on this. They hit the economy with a long lag. So you can announce these sorts of initiatives, but we don't see them traditionally from anywhere from three to eight years. So finding that truth and what happens in reality is not going to happen next year. The market's going to have to be patient on seeing that. And this is why I say heading into end 2022, 2023, there's going to be a pothole in the economy. I think the market is starting to sniff that out. Knowing what you own is so difficult right now, Francis. We hear that term greenwashing. BlackRock put out a transition ETF recently, huge demand for it, loads of inflows, as you might expect. Then you go through the top holdings of this thing, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, and Facebook. Now, maybe they are the leading companies making a transition in the United States of America. Maybe that's the right way to benchmark this ETF. But for the people who are allocating capital to some of these stories, Francis, do you think they really know what they own right now? Hmm, well, my focus on this is actually moving away from company-specific risk, also because I'm a macro strategist, so it's not my area to the same extent, but focusing on country risk on this component and the ESG country screens that are coming through. Sitting up here in Canada is Tom and Vail to everybody. Of course, we're talking about having to do early and cheaper green transitions or fearing access to global capital markets. And I think countries as a whole are going to be accelerating green spending in order to avoid losing capital flows. And that's the component of the macro story that has to integrate the green infrastructure component or you're going to get the trade wrong. Francis, really, really interesting final point. Great to catch up. 
as always, Francis Donald of Man Your Life. Always great to have Francis with us, Lisa, often putting Tom in his place as well. <laughs> yeah. At the very beginning of every single conversation. There are about six questions in there. You want to throw I a mean, seventh there in is, there? there? I is love often it. six questions we in do, there. We do panels together, and she just crushes me on stage. I have no She's doubt fearless. about that, Tom. I want to turn back to these Southwest Airline headlines. Aiming for break even by June. Here's a domestic company, yeah. a domestic tilt to this airline. American Airlines a little bit later this morning. I wonder how different those headlines will be for an international airline like American Tom. Yeah, well, there it is. And, you know, you wonder what the airlines are going to do domestically. International, John, I think, is out of the picture. To your ESG focus, John, I think the, the, the last... 24 hours on J.P. Morgan. My PR firm, Hartley, 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 mentioned this yesterday. What does J.P. Morgan do out of this with their European soccer greed? I can't figure out if they're tarred and feathered by this, John. To me, maybe they're not. Is that Am I right? I, I don't know. I just think there's so many different stakeholders in all of this just sort of miscalculated yeah. how this would play out. And not just the banks and maybe the accountants and the advisors that got involved in all of this, Tom, but also the leaders. You know, we touched on this earlier this week. This wasn't just about foreigners owning British companies, English football teams. This was about the likes of Florentino Perez, the Agnelli family. And I know I've been saying that all week, but I think it's easy to overlook that fact. These are individuals with great experience that have been around the sport for a long, long time that made the mother yeah. of all miscalculations. Nothing to say? Okay. No, I was just thinking about Padres Dodgers. Unreal. I got Padres Dodgers. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> you think, I think you need a mute button. <laughs> okay, coming up, Dr. Jennifer Nudsuk of Johns Hopkins. This is Bloomberg. With the first one news, I'm Ritika Gupta. Credit Suisse is raising about $2 billion to shore up capital. That's after warning of another financial hit from the Archegos capital collapse. $654 million in the second quarter. Here's Credit Suisse CEO Thomas Gottstein. Archegos was uh, a situation that uh, is now being reviewed also uh, by U.S. regulators. Uh, there, it was a very idiosyncratic situation with a family office. Uh, uh, which um, had some deficiencies in terms of disclosure. Um, and, you know, there were six or seven other brokers involved in that. So it was certainly not only a Credit Suisse issue, but we certainly had um, uh, um, higher exposures than others. Meanwhile, the Swiss regulator FINMA has now started enforcement proceedings against Credit Suisse. Bloomberg's learned that the Biden administration will restore California's power to limit auto emissions. That's a shift that will lead to tougher requirements across much of the U.S. Two Trump-era policies limited California's ability to set ambitious vehicle standards. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Looking at uh, what is going to be done uh, um, with some of the vaccines that we are not using, uh, we got to make sure they are safe to be sent, and uh, we hope to be able to be of some help and value to. Uh, countries uh, around the world. That was President Biden on a really important issue. The pace of vaccinations in the United States of America is starting to slow. Supply is not an issue. The pressure is growing to start <clears throat> issuing some of that supply worldwide to where it's needed most. And I think a lot of people right now are thinking of one place, and that's India. From New York City this morning, good morning, alongside Tom Keane. Lisa Abramovitz, I'm Jonathan Ferro. Here's the state of play in this market this Thursday morning. Equities are down two points, not even a tenth of a 1%. The story of the bond market, 155.92. Euro dollar, 120.50. We advanced there a little more than a tenth of 1% going into that ECB rate decision later this morning in about an hour from now at a news conference 45 minutes after that. There's the headline, Tom, connected to the story out of India. Singapore to bar visitors yeah. from India on the deteriorating situation, which is just getting worse and worse. Just a minute. Matter of time until we see that from other geographies. We've seen this with the Philippines, with Brazil as well. We're going to have news on Goldman Sachs here in a moment. Stay with us, Global Wall Street. Right now, Jennifer Nuzzo with us, Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. And all of a sudden, our international health security is important. Jennifer Nuzzo, how far are we from a humanitarian crisis in India? 
Oh, I mean, we're on the brink. The stories that really uh, worry me the most is hearing about shortages of medical oxygen. I mean, to think that you know, you can save people's lives by supplementing their oxygen and they just don't have it. Oxygen, something that's easy to make. That is really, I think, a, a, a severe tragedy. How close are we to shifting to, say, 1947 and the starvation of Europe, the Netherlands, post-World War II Europe? How close are we to where there will be a call for international developed nation and American responsibility to assist India? Oh, we are there. If the call hasn't already been sounded, um, let's sound it now, because there is clearly a deep, deep struggle there, and they need help. And, you know, the United States is not going to be uh, back to normal, um, safe, fully safe, until we help countries end um, the, these very uh, concerning surges of these cases. Based on the surges that we have seen, how much has the end of the pandemic been pushed out? Well, I mean, it's it's really hard to say. I mean, we still have parts of the globe that haven't gone through this yet. And you, you don't want any country to go through this where you see a massive surge of cases. But any country that has not yet had a surge of cases and is not actively vaccinating its population remains at risk to exactly this scenario. I think earlier there were uh, countries that maybe breathed a sigh of relief that somehow assumed that they escaped the worst of this pandemic. But we're seeing um, quite clearly that that's very much not the case, that many parts of the world still remain deeply at risk. So I worry about these headlines continuing for a year or more unless uh, international partners get together and help share some of the vaccines that are there. We need to absolutely make more vaccines. There's clearly a shortage of medical supplies that needs to be addressed. So a lot of work that the globe can do to help countries and to, you know, try to lessen some of these hideous tolls that the pandemic's already had. We need to make more vaccine and we need to convince people to actually get inoculated. John touched on the fact that there is a slowing pace of vaccinations in the United States. How concerning is that? It is quite concerning. I just read a, a study about an outbreak in a nursing home where most of the residents were protected with vaccines, but um, only about 53% of the healthcare workers in the nursing home here in the U.S. Um, had been fully vaccinated. And unfortunately, one of the residents who had been vaccinated in this can happen, particularly in medically frail individuals, died. So this is a real problem. And then, of course, we're hearing about states pulling back on ordering vaccine, that they are not having the kind of uptake that they had been, had been having. Um, this is something that I think we have to address with much urgency. I think there are some people who are probably just trying to wait and see. I think there are some people who uh, don't feel that they want to get vaccinated, but we need to reach both of those people, both of those groups of people and, and convince them that, you know, your time to get vaccinated is as soon as, as you're able. And the faster we do this is the faster we get back to normal. What a tough moment to be a leader of this country right now and make this decision, doctor, because there is so much pressure to take some of the supply here and allocate it to the rest of the world where it's needed most right now. How do you make a decision like that when some parts of your country have decided they don't want this vaccine? Sure. Well, it is a tough decision. And, you know, every elected official, their first responsibility is to the people who uh, uh, elected him or her. Um, in this case, though, the United States have, has more vaccines than we need. Even if um, every single American um, were to get a, a vaccine, we still have more than we need. And so I think it is important for us to um, consider donating at least to cover some some very high uh, risk groups like uh, healthcare workers that are working across the globe. They show up every day, put their lives on the lines to save people's lives. We should be able to protect them. And the U.S. has enough vaccine to be able to um, to help in those efforts. Doctor, thank you. We have to leave it there. Dr. Jennifer Nusso there, Johns Hopkins Centre for Health Security Senior Scholar. What a delicate moment, Lisa. A decision that is really difficult to make for any leader. Of course, you have to put your own people first. But when you start to see it showing up in the data, the hesitancy, in the United States of America, and you see a crisis playing out in Latin America, in India, in Brazil, in places like that, the pressure's gonna build on you to do something. There's the humanitarian aspect of this, the images that are just absolutely horrifying of people uh, struggling to get into the hospital, not enough people, uh, not enough beds, not enough oxygen, but it also is an issue of economic recovery. Can the United States fully recover without the rest of the world on board? The answer is no. We're seeing that already with airlines. Yes, Southwest was okay, but when we see American, it's gonna be a different story due to international travel. Can we end the pandemic unless we do some more outreach? Southwest, OK. Alaska, OK as well. Topping estimates this morning. Once again, an airline with a domestic tilt. TK, I know you wanted to talk about Goldman. Big call this morning. 
It's a big call, and this is one of those tea leaves, John, within earnings season of a reset. This is Keith Horowitz, who writes very careful notes. It's Citigroup, and it's not what he says on Goldman. He says, look, this is not an extrapolation of a boom quarter. We all know they had a boom quarter. It's a refresh of his Excel spreadsheet, and it gets him out, John, up 20% which really gets my attention. Price target, 410, right now 335. Off the back of that first quarter, Tom, let's talk about it. Yeah. Execution, wow. Well, I go back to Brad Hintz at Sanford Bernstein, for Bernstein, who was frankly legendary in this. You don't extrapolate the securities business. It's a good way to lose money. Horowitz is not doing that here. He's not extrapolating out of boom. He's just resetting for their market share dominance and their marginability. And we've had a boom year today on this stock. Lisa, up more than 20, 25 percent and more plus for Goldman stock this year. Yeah, outperforming a lot of the other banks. I do wonder, just on a more bank perspective, not necessarily Goldman Sachs, how long that can continue unless you see a regaining of the reflation trade, because we have seen a bit of a cooling in the yield curve steepening. And how much does that have to regain for the banks to continue to outperform? Up 27 on Goldman. That's a headline we're not discussing when it comes to Credit Suisse. Tom, that news this morning, raising another $2 billion, taking another $600 million hit on the quarter. Just not and pretty. Again, it is the response. It, I, I, I really, you know, I, we don't editorialize, but to be kind, it was uh, not American. The, ur the lack of urgency, I was Well, by floored. definition, it wasn't, Tom, so floored. I think you're allowed to say that. No, we're in control. Business, we're in control. We're, we're, we're in control. Stock's down 6%. Tony Dwyer, up next, Canaccord Genemity Chief, to see here. market strategist, futures down five, off by more than a tenth of one percent of the S&P, ECB decision in the next hour. This is Bloomberg. Just been hugely stress tested here, right, with this bond yield tantrum. And sort of markets sort of survived. We are looking not just at the peaks, right? We are looking at the sustainability of these trends. Where policy stance is today needs to be seen through, but absolutely, there are some tough decisions ahead. What the bond market is telling you right now is not so fast. Fed has the upper hand. We still have the long term structural forces that weigh against significant acceleration and growth. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. From New York City for our audience worldwide, good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance live on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures this morning slightly negative. You will hear from the President of the United States on this Earth Day in the next hour. Going into that, we will have an ECB rate decision 45 minutes following that decision. You will hear from President Christine Lagarde. We need to talk about this market and one bank in particular, Credit Suisse, down another 6.5% in Zurich trading off the back of raising another $2 million and taking another 600 million hit off the back of this Archegos chaos, Tom. And, John, more importantly than that, the intraday chart on Credit Suisse and Zurich is a fragile down 6%. We haven't broken down to the twice lows of the last three or four hours, but by no means is it a drop down off the share dilution and then a move up. We haven't seen that yet. Lisa, raising capital, raising capital, raising capital. The issue for Credit Suisse is we've seen this story so many times now in recent times and over the last 10 years, too. We also don't really understand what exactly happened at Credit Suisse, and it comes at a time uh, when a lot of banks are reassessing how much leverage they're going to extend within their prime brokerage units. I thought, John, really interesting that the SEC is considering uh, forcing more disclosure for hedge funds around the derivatives positions. Of course, hedge funds pushing back and saying that that would tip their hand, and it also would subject them to uh, potentially uh, bad publicity and, and pushback. And, and, are we calling and this a hedge fund now? Well, I, I mean, for all know, intents and purposes, it was no, operating like that. Not just semantics. I think it's an important question to ask because I think if you are a hedge fund, you might be sitting there saying, well, what are they? Are they a hedge fund? That's fair. And how many other family offices are there that are getting away from the disclosures and the regulation of a hedge fund by calling themselves family offices, but operating in an even more risky manner than even hedge funds themselves, John? Tom, you understand the history of this better than most. This goes before Godstein. It goes before TM. It goes yes, before yes, 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 yes. And yes. we often ask the European banks, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> and we still haven't figured that out, have we? 
There are partitions of European banking. I'm going to look at BNP Paribas in Paris. John is very much consumer uh, banking, a well-run conservative clip. These are stereotypes, and people can disagree. Zurich is a world of its own, UBS clearly outperforming. But even there, UBS's relative performance to the American banks, um, I think most would suggest, is tepid. There's just a different set of rules in Zurich. How long can they sustain that? Tom, look at the spread. Credit Suisse is down 19% year to date in a year where Goldman Sachs is up 27 percentage points. You go back to that city call yeah. in the last hour, <clears throat> different worlds, different execution, same climate. Same, same place. We're operating in the same environment, and yet it's a different world for these two banks. I'm going to cut them some slack there, maybe apples and oranges and all that. I don't know what the apples to apples is on Credit Suisse, but I, I just think there's a point where patience runs out. And in all the reporting this morning, John, what I really noted is Credit Suisse's relationship with the Swiss elite community is what's really at focus here. It's not something you and I are focusing on now, but that matters in Zurich. This is what I'm focused on right now. American Airlines seeing second quarter total revenue down about 40% versus 2019. I think it's important to compare things to 2019 and not 2020, Lisa, because yeah. 2020 was yeah. so bad. Tom, second quarter revenue down about 40% versus 2019. Really underlining the fact that, yes, we will reopen. <clears throat> yes, demand for domestic travel will be absolutely huge, humongous in the United States of America. The international story is going to look very, very different for the time being. Ed Bastian leading on that at Delta, he told us that, I don't know, eight, six weeks ago to our David Weston. And it's just the way it is, John. But to focus on the constructive international, excuse me, the domestic story in America that is completely related to vaccines, case dynamics and death dynamics, cases have leveled out. That's the lead this morning. American Airlines up by about 2.6%. And Tom's right to point out, <clears throat> cases have leveled out. The issue with America right now is vaccinations. Vaccinations have started to roll over a little bit as well. We'll touch on that later this hour. From New York, then, here's the price action going into the opening bell. We're shaping up as follows in the equity market on the S&P 500. We're down a touch. We're off by six points on the S&P and negative a little more than a tenth of 1%. Into the bond market, unchanged there too at 155.56 on tens. Euro dollar, the one to watch. It's a non-decision at 7.45 Eastern for many of you from the ECB. 120.51. <laughs> it has got to be about that news conference. Lisa, we'll spend the hour talking about it just a little bit. But OK, you want to front load, you want to buy more debt. Are you doing that? Is that what this is? Well, and that's what a lot of people are asking. Yeah, and right now what you're seeing is they are front-loading the debt, but not by that much. And then what happens after June? That non-decision is 7.45 a.m., way to sell it. We've got Christine Lagarde uh, coming out at 8.30 a.m. with the press conference. That'll be a lot first. more interesting. The 7.45 decision will be the ECB rate uh, decision. Meanwhile, at 8 a.m., President Biden is going to be kicking off a two-day summit uh, on climate change, how to fight emissions. He has pledged to reduce <coughs> the U.S. emissions in half by 2030. Can he get the of the world on board. It's a tough sell right now, especially as a lot of countries try to battle the economic pain of the pandemic. And then at 8.30 a.m., talking about the economic pain, the U.S. jobless claims come out. Initial claims have been a messy figure. They are expected to show an increase in filings, highlighting the pain, perhaps highlighting how this is an unreliable figure in, in determining uh, labor uh, progression, John. But it really does raise a question of how quickly we're climbing out of this <clears throat> hole. We still do have restrictions in place. Lisa, you're right putting those two together at the end there. The president will speak a little bit later this morning. We'll take some of those comments at 8 a.m. Eastern time right here on TV and radio. The president will speak addressing Earth Day, Tom, but top of the pile is how he sells this domestically. It's about creating good-paying union jobs. Well, In the words of this administration, it's about putting America at the epicenter of this. John, we're at the middle or the beginning middle of what J.P. Morgan and Michael Ferroli call, call, uh, call, uh, say is a 7 million job creation. we got to do that before we start adding the jobs off of February of a year ago. We've got to work our way through this international pandemic as well. Forgive me yeah. from jumping from one story to another, but another headline no, it's that kind of Bloomberg. Day. The Japanese Prime Minister Suga recommending virus emergency state for Tokyo. Tom, that just crossed in the Bloomberg. And this is the issue right now, isn't it? It's Japan. It's India. It's Brazil. It's much of Latin America, with maybe the right. exclusion of Chile at the moment, which has done a wonderful job of rolling out the vaccine. And the too. compare and contrast, John, of Japan with Korea doing much, much better. And of course, all this wrapped around how they approach the Olympics. And I believe it's 93 days. Yeah, the countdown continues. How do you approach this market? Tony Dwyer joins us now. Canaccord Genovese Chief Market Strategist. Tony, we've stalled, but you say the power is still on. What do you mean by that? 
So when you're when you think about an air show, you know, just about everybody's gone to an air show and they see a plane screaming across the runway horizontally and all of a sudden it pulls up and it goes straight up and the power's on, the engines are cooking, and all of a sudden it gets up to a certain part and it just stops going up no matter how much power is added to it you just lose lift and that's kind of our that's our call for and it's our analogy for what could happen in the market we know that the fundamental backdrop is very positive you know how optimistic i have been and continue to be on the macro backdrop of excess liquidity fueling a a, a strong global recovery that's not going to change but that's also so well known the markets are so overbought enthusiasm is so high that I think we're approaching that stall speed for a little while. Tony, I want to give you a major shout out. You've had the courage to be in the market. I put Gina Martin Adams of Bloomberg in that camp. There's others as well. David Costin at Goldman's been quite good. But Tony, you link it right into economics. Aren't we as far from recession as we've ever been? Well, I, I think, it, again, Tom, we, we always try to paint each environment as unique. And, of course, the reason you go into a recession is unique, and it creates a credit crisis, and it creates a Fed that is extraordinarily accommodative. So where we are economically is sort of where we were in 2004 and 2010, coming out of those kind of never-before-seen recessions where you get this economic lift, that creates uncertainty in the interest rate environment, what the Fed's going to do. Are, are they going to um, do what Canada did yesterday and pull back a little bit on quantitative easing? So this isn't unique. Things are good. We're at the beginning of an economic and market cycle. But in that process, you can have periods of a stall. And that that's all we're talking about here is not an economic catastrophe uh, by any stretch, just a little bit of a market pause. The stall speed is very much having to do with markets, not economic data, which has actually come out better right. than expected, notwithstanding perhaps the claims uh, number that comes out in about 90 minutes time. Uh, that's the expectation anyway. What are you looking for? What are markets looking for to resume that lift, that turbocharged uh, climb into the sky, to use your analogy terribly, um, in, in order to to go back into the market? I really think, Lisa, you, you need to reset expectations. The next leg higher, I think, has to come from a place where people look around and say, I'm not invested enough. I think most of the data suggests um, that everybody's overly invested. And there's been some deterioration under in the small cap world and in the NASDAQ stocks. So uh, again, think about it this way. About six weeks ago, we, we downgraded the financials, which we'd been very positive on. You know, our banks and tanks call got a lot of attention. But we downgraded the financials because we thought interest rates had seen a peak. And people were saying, how could you think that rates are going to come down on the long end with inflation expectations picking up and almost a million jobs being created? But that's what happened. Sometimes those fundamental factors are discounted in the market and to create the next leg higher, which I think will happen in rates, which I think will happen in stocks. You just need that pause that refreshes, that resets expectations to a more normal level. Tony, always great to get your perspective. You always drain the drama. Tony Dwyer, Canaccord Generity Chief Market Strategist. It is welcome, sir. We've got a lot to get through this morning. The President of the United States will be addressing the world, re-upping, renewing the commitment of this federal government to the climate change issue. We will hear from the President in about 50 minutes from now. We need to talk about earnings in America. Southwest saying it is hopeful the cash burn will stop in June. American Airlines still sees a continued recovery. We need to talk about the macro, the ECB, a rate decision at 7.45 Eastern, a news conference 45 minutes after that. And then, Tom, we need to talk about the world of banking. Credit Suisse down by 5.76% in Zurich trading. The focus for you and I, for Lisa, too, I think this morning, not so much Frankfurt right now, right. it's Zurich. And it's a relative basis as well. You asked me about the difference. John, JP Morgan with a price to book off the BQ screen, 1.84. Credit Suisse uh, a little bit reduced, 0 0.50. That's It's not Deutsche Bank, but it's on the edge of Deutsche Bank. It tells a story, doesn't it? Coming up, 8 a.m. Eastern time, we'll be catching up with Andrew Sheets, Morgan Stanley, Chief Cross Asset Strategist from New York City this morning. Good morning. Tom Keane, Lisa Abramowitz, Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. With the first word news, I'm Ritika Gupta. President Biden will pledge to cut U.S. greenhouse gas emissions in half by 2030. That 
nearly doubles the commitment made under former President Obama that was later scrapped by former President Trump. President Biden will convene 40 world leaders in a virtual climate summit that begins today. More fallout from Credit Suisse from the implosion of Archegos Capital. The Swiss bank expects a $654 million second quarter hit from Archegos Plus. The Swiss regulator Finma has asked Credit Suisse to add more than $2 billion of capital. We talk with Credit Suisse CEO Thomas Gottstein. We are all responsible for what happened. It's now our job to uh, take Credit Suisse to the next level. Uh, as I said, we have uh, a lot of good elements in this first quarter we can build on. And together with the board of directors, we are doing this investigation and we will build on that. Meanwhile, Swiss regulators are starting enforcement proceedings against Credit Suisse. Joe Biden is set to become the first U.S. president in 40 years to recognize the mass killings of Armenians as genocide. That runs the risk of upsetting an already fragile relationship with Turkey. Bloomberg's learned that the president's pronouncement will likely coincide with Saturday's Armenian Genocide Day. The killings took place under the Ottoman Empire, which later became Turkey and various successor states. Global News 24 hours a day on air. And on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Jobs plan is the cornerstone of the administration's approach to address climate change. It will be the most significant public investment in America since the 1960s, dramatically reducing U.S. emissions by greening the electricity and transportation sectors. It's about creating good paying union jobs in the words Nailed of it. this administration <clears throat> at the epicenter of this push this morning on Earth Day. The Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen from New York City this morning. Good morning. Alongside Tom Keane, Lisa Abrambitz, I'm Jonathan Ferro. Here's the price action. Your equity market looks like this on the S&P 500. Equities pulling back a little bit, down a tenth of 1%. In the bond market, yields 156.09. Euro dollar 120.56. Going into a rate decision in about 30 minutes and a news conference 45 minutes after that. Euro dollar advancing two tenths of one percent. So Tom, here's the announcement. The president will be speaking in about 42 minutes time. This coming from the administration, the United States announcing a new target to achieve a 50 to 52 percent reduction from 2005 levels in economy wide net greenhouse gas pollution in 2030. Certainly, John, the domestic switch here from Trump to Biden is extraordinary. Maybe we've never seen it in the history of our pollution, but it's also the international setup as well. Josh Wingrove go, uh, joins us, our White House correspondent, specifically on this speech. Josh, the president wraps us around a busted Paris agreement, which was 196 parties. Which of those parties is the president speaking to this morning? Well, he's focusing on the big emitters, Tom, I think. Like, in particular, of course, we've got Vladimir Putin uh, participating. And I think what we think uh, they're going to do is try to reclaim or, you know, at least take a stab at reclaiming this sort of mantle of U.S. leadership. As you say, that 50 to 52 percent number is, in fact, double what Barack Obama had pledged. There's risk here for Joe Biden. He sort of <laughs> held together the Democratic Party in a way that people didn't really expect him to. Like he wasn't Mr. Progressive, you know, as of a year or so ago. This move obviously will delight that wing of the party, but will open him up to attacks that we saw from Trump and other Republicans, in particular around the impact on the oil sector, for instance. So I think Biden is walking a bit of a tightrope here. He doesn't want to right. lose some of those middles, but he uh, he's really managed somehow, I think, exceeding expectations to hold together the Democratic coalition. There are many trust deficits here. You mentioned the gentleman from Russia. I don't know what his climate, strange, uh, climate change strategy is on the eastern border of Ukraine, but there's mm. all these other international issues. Is climate change discreet from those issues, or does the president adapt to other stories? 
It's a little bit of an X factor, but I think they've tried to tamp it down because they've said there'll be no bilaterals scheduled as part of this. You know, when these are in person, you get these sort of pull aside conversations in the hallway. That's where the real business gets done. You know, virtual summit, at least nothing scheduled. Very little, if not no, opportunity for sort of impromptu engagement about that. So I, I would sort of. I think they're purposefully punting on that. We might see, of course, that come up in further summits down the road if and when, in particular, Joe Biden starts traveling again. But, you know, he's coming up on his first 100-day marker. He, uh, you know, they think they've done well on vaccinations. They think they, uh, you know, are doing pretty well uh, on the economy. They're starting to tout that new aid package next week during a speech to Congress. He's going to detail the next package, the families plan, the third bill. Uh, and so you know, that one is viewed as least likely to pass Congress uh, right now. So, you know, a lot of moving parts for him. He's starting to pivot a little bit into his presidency, and that's the sort of backdrop of this climate summit. Josh, just one final question for me on this climate summit. As you point out, it's the federal government that has a credibility issue here. Corporations, cities are going ahead and doing what they need to do anyway, regardless of who's in the White House. So when you set a target like this this morning, that alone won't reclaim credibility. What are the policies behind this renewed effort from this administration? I mean, it, it remains a very open question what power Biden has or even what power Biden plus Congress have. He's taken steps to restrict new oil and gas development, in particular on public lands, that sort of thing. You know, there's been a question from environmental groups whether he can do more on methane. But overall, to get to this number, uh, you know, it, they say that they've crunched the numbers and this is the number that their tools can get them to. But obviously the proof is going to be in the pudding. And I think a lot of people will be uh, wanting to see that, saying that this is a pretty big number to hit on your own. Well, and the proof is also going to be on what sort of legislative proposals he can get through based on what support he has or doesn't have from the Republican leadership. Where are the Republicans on coming on board with some sort of green proposals? We know that they're on board with certain types of infrastructure spending. How much, though, on these climate reduction or, or carbon reduction policies? Yeah, I, I'm not showing a lot of uh, love for them so far, I think, fair to say. The, the talk right now is whether that jobs plan might itself be split in two, sort of, you know, Empire Strikes Back split into two little, <laughs> three little mini movies in between of the trilogy, because the one part, the infrastructure part, that could get Republican support. So the question for Democrats is, OK, we've got the second bill. Do we cut it in half, put some of it through on a bipartisan basis and ram through the rest? On our own, that is an open question right now. When when, uh, when Republicans talk about infrastructure, you know, you might get them to talk about some green infrastructure in, in terms of energy, maybe. But really, they want to stick to the sort of traditional, old school, OG inter infrastructure. We're talking, you know, roads, bridges, that sort of thing. So really, not a lot of appetite so far from Republicans on this. And Republicans are accusing Biden of having hollow pledges of bipartisanship. Of course, stalwart of the Senate, they think he's bringing them in, talking to them, and then basically ignoring them after. And we've seen that. We've seen that before, and we'll see it again maybe as well. Josh, just quickly on diplomacy. The UK, when Biden was elected as the President of the United States, there was a belief that the outreach would come on this particular issue. There was a belief also that for China and the Chinese Communist Party, the outreach, the bridge building, would be around this particular issue. Is this a bargaining chip to avoid a collision elsewhere for the likes of China, the likes of Russia? Um, I think so. I think that they view it more broadly than that. I think that they view it that they, they, they are only going to have chips on the table if they get in the game. And I think that's the context of them making these pledges right now. That's the context of them hosting this summit right now. Uh, and one of the big questions in the coming months is like, will Joe Biden, for instance, attend the G7 summit in person? And that's when I think you'll start to see them you know, put those chips on the table, as we say, and that's when they become those bargaining chips. Josh, I know you don't usually wake up before eight, so thank you. I know, it's we just appreciate amazing. It. It's I know, just seriously. Original. This is new, isn't it? You're just going nice. to him. Like, thank you, like, Josh. I, I think we ought to do this to tomorrow. We were so yeah. kind to him for so long, for a full five minutes. Josh, thank you. Josh Wingrove, <laughs> Bloomberg White House correspondent. <laughs> Josh will be back now, Tom, tomorrow morning. That's I, it. I think we'll we see ought him before to, eight know, every yeah, morning, will absolutely. we? Absolutely. I look forward to that. The early edition. This is the defining issue for this administration in many ways, Tom. They're trying to sell it domestically by talking about hiring, good paying union jobs well, by America, America the epicenter. And I think Lisa's right to point out in the previous hour, how they sell it internationally might be a little bit different. But John, what's so important here is what happens after the Biden administration. If we have a Democrat administration, or particularly the GOP wins, 
How, what do we do? Do we swing back to the Trump view on climate change? That is no where one knows. the credibility issue is. Yeah. And Lisa, that is why it's the federal government specifically with a credibility issue. It's not the cities and it's not corporations who will continue to do what they have been doing <clears throat> for the last several years, the last decade. That's why it's important to see what kinds of proposals they actually put in place that have legs that can continue beyond this current administration. Coming up, Peter Westaway, Vanguard Asset Management Chief Economist and Head of the Investment Strategy Group on this Earth Day. Also an ECB rate decision day. 20 minutes away. This is Bloomberg. New York City for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance live on TV and radio. Here's the price action this Thursday morning, about 15 minutes away from an ECB rate decision. Equity <laughs> futures coming in five points on the S&P 500, down around about a tenth of 1%. The Nasdaq down by two tenths of 1%. The airlines, the focus this morning. Remain Bostick will jump in in just a moment and bring you some of the numbers to look at. If you switch up the board and get to the bond market, bond mar why do I do that every single morning at 7.30? Can I start again, Tom? Just I would start, you know, I mean, you're, you're a little, you're a little rattled. It's hard flow. to focus given the football in Europe. Thank you, John, Tom. you've been off your game Thank for three you. days. I appreciate that. I don't know if that was an insult or support. Yields up around about a basis point on a 10-year to 156.80. Over in Germany, negative 25 basis points. Now, this is the one, isn't it, Tom? If this is going to be the quarter for Europe, in the words of Deutsche Bank, oh, you're talking what economics. will happen oh, to okay. yields? What will happen to yields? And will it be consistent with an improving yeah. outlook? Will the ECB stop that move higher? I'm looking at the Swiss 20 year there, John, but I thought you were talking about the Super League in Germany. I, I mean, Germany largely that. avoided that, right? They did. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about buns. Okay, sorry. Negative Excuse 25. Me. Lost into my the head. ECB. Clearly, switch up the board and finish on this Let's in foreign exchange. Deutsche Bank talking about the quarter for Europe. This is what Goldman's talking about. Rate differentials in Europe's favour. Flows in Europe's favor. Euro dollar yeah. a move towards 125, perhaps. Tom, right now, 120.58. You can feel the bulls. They're starting to sound a little bit louder, aren't they? You can hear them. The bulls getting a little bit louder I around agree. a stronger euro. When do they, but John, when do they start arguing about 125 euro as being damaging to the business might of Europe? Well, that's the issue, isn't it? On both rates and a single currency, yeah. at what point does the ECB start to step in? Questions for Christine Lagarde in around about an hour <clears> from now. Remain, yeah. I have to say, you're so patient yeah. allowing Tom and I just to go through all this in the way we do. Thank you, sir. I yeah. appreciate it. We appreciate it. Absolutely. I do my I mean, yoga every you know, morning here before I come get on this, this, guys. Well, we talk about some of the big <laughs> movers here the in the pre market. <laughs> radio <laughs> remains bow tieless today. I mean, Thank it's, you. It's, it's Thank you, crazy. Tom. I'm sure radio listeners appreciate that. They'll also appreciate uh, kind of what's happening here uh, with the airline stocks. It's, it's kind of a yes. mixed bag here because we had basically earnings that were more or less in line with what the street expected, which was basically declining revenue and a loss on the quarter. The outlook also is going to show declining revenue, at least from 2020 levels. A lot of the airline CEOs are trying to point you to 2019 and say, when you look back at those 2019 levels with regards to capacity and passenger traffic, they say they're getting back there. American Airlines saying they could get there by this summer. Southwest Airlines also making a similar forecast, saying that by the time they get to this summer, basically June, July here, their cash burn might finally be through. They might finally start to see 2019 levels of demand here. And more importantly, they say the worst is kind of all behind us here. Now, of course, despite that optimistic tone that they're taking, the numbers themselves are bad, and we should sort of point that out. But investors do seem to think that maybe a bottom is in the works. I put, also want to bring your attention here to Ford, which is up about 2% here in the pre-market. This is actually the second biggest volume mover in the pre-market, despite no real news here. There was an upgrade over at Wolf Research ahead of the company's earnings next week. And keep in mind, a lot of people have their eyes on this climate summit uh, down in Washington, with Joe Biden saying this is going to put a lot of focus on the EV makers and specifically the more traditional automakers. There's this general sense here now that the beneficiaries of this push that Biden is making is not necessarily going to be those smaller EV makers. You flip up the board and you see that reflected in a downgrade that we saw earlier this morning for Fisker. This over at Goldman Sachs basically saying that these smaller companies like Fisker, like Lordstown and Workhorse and others, they're really going to be left in the dust now that Ford, GM and the 
other yeah, big automakers have finally sort of caught up here. They're basically, Goldman's basically saying this is basically now a competition between GM, Ford, Tesla, and a couple yeah, of European Romain, automakers. I'm really, I'm really, really glad you bring yeah. this up because it's almost a Euro equivalent to what VW and Porsche have done. Yeah, and this is, and, and now everyone's saying if you look at the proposals that Biden has on the table, in yeah. order to execute some of those proposals, unfortunately, right. some of these smaller companies just don't you know, really have Romain, the capacity. I have no for. clue what I'm talking about. I'm just trying to pretend I'm like Matt Miller. <laughs> you know, that's all. <laughs> well, you're doing a great job Thank here. You. Thank you. Best Can I, I give you one other? How about, one, how about one other European one for you before I leave, Tom? Oh, please. Qualtrics at the bottom of your screen. That's ticker XM. If you remember, this was the customer software uh, business of SAP that was spun off back in January this year. It really sort of languished right above that $30 IPO price. Uh, this is the biggest mover, at least on a percentage basis out there yeah. in the market, up about 15% uh, here on the day after their earnings and a relatively bullish forecast. Romain, thank you so much. Yeah. Right now, one of the most professional. Interesting... Can you just promo the close too, Tom, before we move on? The close don't, don't is on today. That? Yeah, it's the close today. is on today. Taylor really? Riggs. Max, that was good. Romain, Caroline, you know, did I do that? The, Tom no, that's, the that's, uh, no. that's, no. that's the really fee. sold it, Tom. That's the fee we <laughs> have to They're all going to tune in. That's it. Am I doing okay? <laughs> you You're are. doing great. great. Romain, okay. thank you. Carry on. Thank you. Okay. Peter Westaway with us, and this is important. He has York Mathematics and really interesting pedigree out of Cambridge in operational research and economics with Nomura for years at Vanguard Asset Management now as their chief economist. Peter, I am thrilled to have you on today about the Thank complexities you. of the moment for the ECB. And to me, it goes back to the heart of the matter, the almost bipolar ECB of years going back to Otmar Ising, which is the Germanic thrust of worry about inflation, versus everybody else. Is that bipolar nature still in place? I think it's definitely the case that relative to, say, the Fed or even the Bank of England, the ECB tends to put more emphasis on worrying about inflation. But let's face it, in the situation they're in at the moment where the inflation rate is very long way south of the inflation target of just below 2%, I don't think uh, in, emerging inflation is anything that policymakers in the ECB are, are worrying about at the moment. You know, for them, it's all about how long do they keep this accommodative policy in place to try and get the economy moving again. Well, and there's also what? a question about how much they accelerate their bond buying beyond June. And we've already heard differing opinions from different members of the ECB. How much of a cohesive message are we going to hear from Christine Lagarde today? Or is this just basically a moving target, depending on who you speak with? I think it's always difficult because there are different voices on the ECB. I think she will err on the side of, of being more dovish than, than less dovish. I think it's really important to, to, to keep that signal that the ECB will do whatever it takes to get inflation back up. Um, no doubt the news has been quite positive lately. The, the vaccine rollout is just about getting going now. Some of the real economy news has been good. And even the news out of the US is going to have knock-on consequences for the for the EU because of uh, you know, the, the the effect of the global economy. So overall, there's some good news, but I think they're not going to take their foot off the accelerator quite yet. So I think so far the the bond purchases from the ECB have probably been at the bottom end of what they could have done and what people were expecting. So I think for now we'll 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 hear about more bond purchases, and they won't be talking about taking that stimulus away some, uh, for some time yet. Uh, Peter, if we can, can we get into the technical detail of that? They talked about front-loading in this quarter. I want to understand from your perspective whether you see evidence of that and where you look for it. Is it in net buying, gross buying? What ultimately matters right now? I mean, I, I think it should come in the net buying, and, and I, I don't particularly buy the, that it's particularly front-loaded. So. I will be looking for them to, to carry on at the current rate or probably for e, uh, at an even in, enhanced rate. So maybe pushing it up to 20 billion, um, down from the 17, up from the 17 that they've been at uh, so far. But um, I mean, in a way, the, the question then becomes when do they start phasing that back or tapering it, as some yep. people like yep. to call it. I don't think we'll see that really until sometime into, into Q3. They could even announce uh, an increased rate of, of bond purchases now. But I think given what I just said about the, the slightly stronger outlook, the slightly better news on a range of issues, I think they're probably going to stick with what they said before and just 
deliver on that. I understand that a lot of people love to ask this question, the credibility question of a central bank. Do you think they do have a little bit of a credibility issue right now? If they come out in a news conference and talk about front-loading buying and net purchases, according to Unicredit, and we're all looking at the same numbers, are up about 10% over the Q1 <coughs> average, can we call that front-loading? Peter, you say we can't. So if we can't, has this central bank got a credibility issue? I think that there's that. There's the fact, you know, I use the word whatever it takes. I think I think it's a bit of a push to really think that the ECB are doing whatever it takes. And, and ultimately, what one has to look at the, the ability over the past and now of, of the ECB actually hitting their inflation target, and they've, they've struggled. And, of course, there's a pandemic going on, which has affected everybody. But even going back further, they've always struggled to, to, to hit that, that 2% or slightly below. So I think going forward, this policy review, which is probably going to allow them to reorient their, their policy towards maybe hitting an average of inflation at 2%. I don't think they'll go the whole way to going to average inflation targeting like the Fed are, but I think yep. at least yep. to hit 2 on average rather than hit below 2 and possibly something else. I think that would be a big step, uh, and I think they then need to be seen to to deliver on that. They clearly need some more structure to bind the hands of the governing council. Peter, it's great to catch up and to get your perspective on what's happening with the ECB. Peter Westerway of Vanguard Asset Management. In many ways, the <clears> ECB <throat> president, Christine Lagarde, faces the same issue that President Draghi, President Trichet faced, Tom. The Hawks are making a little bit more well, noise. Well, that's the what FT, I, Did I do okay there the with FT, a bipolar I, thing? I, I agree. The FT in the last 24 hours reporting that there are some Hawks making a lot of noise over the pandemic exactly. emergency purchase program I, already. I don't think a thing has changed. I mean, Axel Weber's now over holding court at UBS. But, John, on, on dramatically separate occasions, I've heard the same tone from Otmar Issing that I heard from Axel Weber when he was running the Bundesbank. They're not happy with this more modern ECB structure. Elisa, just week by week, month by one, month, there's just a little bit more pressure on Christine Lagarde, the president of the ECB. Yeah, but the question to me is the economic uncertainty, and they don't really have the same pressure that the Federal Reserve has in terms of raising rates. It's the opposite, which is how much more can they ease and how much can they get people on board for that, John? The good news, though, for the Federal Reserve is the hands are tied. They're all singing from the same hymn sheet. It is so different. In okay, Europe. but also, yes. so, the chase, so John, you're okay, expert great. at this. What is she? The first time I saw Farrell, he's standing out in front in the rain with an umbrella at the ECB. I'm going, who the hell is this guy? John, you are expert the start at of a this. Beautiful friendship. How's Lagarde doing? <laughs> In the economics community, there's been some pushback. Let's push it, put it that way. This isn't my view. This is the view of a lot of people I've spoken to. There's clearly a little bit of a credibility issue here. If the ECB president comes into a news conference and talks about front-loading bond buying and net purchases are only up 10% over the Q1 average, right. is that front-loading bond buying? To what degree is it? Yeah. They're the question she'll be peppered with a little bit later this morning. Yeah, John, this is ex-ante transitory. That's it. He says it and then drinks. I think he just wants an excuse it's to not drink. Exposed, it's not You're the only person who plays a drinking game with yourself. I've right. never seen anything like it before. Oh, my gosh. You say the words so you can have a drink. John, this started with Genesee Cream Ale. And what do you want to now? Well. Yeah, there we there go. There are a couple pieces selling. From, from New York City, Jersey. this he, is Bloomberg. You know, <laughs> Forge Gin is just outstanding in the morning. With the first word news, I'm Rutika Gupta. Credit Suisse is raising about $2 billion to shore up capital. That's after warning of another financial hit from the Archegos capital collapse. $654 million in the second quarter. Here's Credit Suisse CEO Thomas Gottstein. Archegos was uh, a situation that uh, is now being reviewed also uh, by U.S. regulators, uh, there, it was a very idiosyncratic situation with a family office uh, uh, which um, had some deficiencies in terms of disclosure um, and, you know, there were six or seven other brokers involved in that, so it was certainly not only a Credit Suisse issue, but we certainly had um, uh, um, higher exposures than others. Meanwhile, the Swiss regulator FINMA has now started enforcement proceedings against Credit Suisse. 
A new surge in coronavirus infections is threatening to further divide the world economy between the rich and the poor, and it could damage overall global growth if the fresh outbreaks spread or if key sources of demand falter. More people were diagnosed with COVID last week than any other since the pandemic began. Bloomberg's learned that the Biden administration will restore California's power to limit auto emissions. That's a shift that will lead to tougher requirements across much of the U.S. Two Trump-era policies limited California's ability to set ambitious vehicle standards. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. base case is still very promising for, for the U.S. economy. We still have the long-term structural forces that weigh against significant acceleration in growth, um, aging population and, and others. Those structural forces should bring us back to a modest growth, relatively benign inflationary environment. That was Brian Levitt there, Invesco Global Market Strategist. As we count you down to a rate decision from the ECB, some really encouraging headlines coming out of the airline industry after a tough couple of weeks for those stocks. Business travel return coming pretty quickly, according to American Airlines. So that's another encouraging I'd headline that. out of the airlines, John. Tom. The mood Absolutely. music improves this morning, doesn't it? They're all saying the right things. Yeah, I've seen a massive shift in business, and the pricing to me is very, very sharp. There's a lot of people saying, I'm going to fly, but I'm only going to fly if I'm flying business. And that's across all the economic uh, spectrum. Futures down about five or six points on the S&P 500, off by a tenth of 1%. We'll stay on top of the domestic story here in the United States of America. Got to stay on top of what's happening in Europe as well. Here's the rate decision, unchanged at the shock. ECB. Oh. Yeah. Refi rate at zero. <laughs> These are the marginal basis. lending facility <laughs> rate at 25 basis points. The depot rate at negative 50 basis points. Rates at the present or lower levels until the inflation goal is near. The PEP program, the pandemic emergency purchase program, will run at least through the end of March 2022. The ECB will keep buying 20 billion euros a month under the asset purchase program. The ECB affirming the size of the pandemic purchase program okay. of at least 1.85 trillion euros. You know, I hate to say this, folks, but Pharaoh's actually expert at this. He really actually pays attention to all this. Is this just a bunch of mumbo jumbo, John? I mean, they come out with all these headlines, <laughs> which are Greek to me, and frankly, they're just moving the deck chairs on the Titanic, in okay. this case, out to March of 2022. <laughs> can it, I, can I know, just say uh, one thing? Of course serious. you can, Lisa. You can say more than one I thing. Mean, honestly, sure. look, this is not mumbo jumbo. They're keeping things the same. Options trading ahead of this meeting showed that it was the least anticipated East CB meeting since the pandemic started. People expected this to be a snooze fest for them to be moving the deck chairs for now. Really, okay. the issue, John, is going to be the news conference, John, right? This is largely another, expected. Absolutely. John, there's another headline end of 2023. Are we just waiting, John, for the ECB headline out to 2024? Here's the headline that I think matters right now in the near Please. term, and we can talk about the longer term in a moment. The ECB confirming significantly faster pace of pet purchases this quarter. So let's work through that just a little bit because everybody's looking at the same numbers right now in the pandemic emergency purchase program. Net purchases, including redemptions, are running at about 10% above the average of the first quarter. Is that front loading? Is that significantly faster at the beginning of this quarter? A lot of people didn't get the clarity they wanted in the previous news conference. I think they're going to be looking for that right. in this news conference. It's a little bit technical, I know, but that's where the focus will be in this news conference, I think, for many market participants. Yeah above and across yeah. Europe and beyond. And just so I can translate, folks, on radio and television, when John says it's a little bit technical, what he means is, Tom, you're dumb as wood. That's just, not what know, I'm saying, that, but if you want yeah, to say that about yourself, you I mean, can. You know, I mean, it's just within the family here. Right now, on that point of clarity, let us migrate to James Athey, Aberdeen Standards Senior Investment Manager. And what's so important here, James, is you write it up as well on the poor communication. Who is poorly communicating around Christine Lagarde? Uh, hi, morning, Tom. Can I give you a virtual high five first? Because uh, I kind of agree on the mumbo jumbo point, to be honest with you. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think central bank communication in general and ECB communication specifically has become really a parody because it's apparent, you know, the theory behind this is that it's transparent 
uh, communication of one's reaction function so that markets can smooth the transition between policy changes. And that's not what we get here at all. I mean, the focus, you know, John, you're talking about the pace of purchases. We have to argue over the semantics of what significantly means. You we don't do, think yeah. 10% is significant. Maybe the ECB does. But what purpose is this really serving? I just think now it creates more distortions and creates bigger problems than it solves in, in any way, shape or form. So who's communicating poorly? Well, the institution. I don't think Madame Lagarde has necessarily settled down as quickly as, as would have been hoped. She's had several communication missteps. But more importantly, and again, Tom, you've made this point brilliantly already, this is this is sort of institutional within the ECB because of the very nature of, uh, you know, the people round the table and the fact that they come from sovereign nations, which are, are not sort of formally bound together in the same way that the states of, of the US are. So you have different people with different domestic economic situations to deal with uh, and different bond markets, more importantly, to, re to uh, report back to. And of course, that means that they have a very different view of what the appropriate path of policy is. James, you're making a couple of points there, and they're all important ones. I think that the ECB has a credibility issue around the semantics right now. Don't think it matters so much. At a time of stress, you need real credibility. And if they can't define what significantly front-loading actually is and what it means, and if it is 10% above the average of the first quarter, then the next time they come out and there's real stress on, say, the periphery, and they say, we'll front load, and this market looks at that and says, well, we've heard this before, and front loading means X, Y, Z, then you've got a problem. So the credibility issue right now might not be a problem, but it could be in the near term. You also brought up the ECB president, Christine Lagarde. I've spoken to so many people on background, off the record, who have got an opinion on this, but don't want to talk about it on the record. James, so let's talk about it on the record right now. Why is she finding it so difficult to communicate with this market, A? And why is she finding it so difficult to get the governing council to come along with her and not talk behind the scenes and not make leaks and not do all these kind of things? What is she struggling with specifically? So I think the first problem from the ECB's perspective is that they're so far, you know, monetary policy and, and the, the, the levers that they're pulling, the policies that they're implementing are just so far from monetary policy, really. It's untrue. You know, this has become very much managing financial markets first and foremost. The purported transmission from actions into inflation outcomes or growth outcomes has long since been forgotten. There's not even a pretense that this is a traditional transmission of economic uh, policy from, uh, you know, central bankers' words to uh, the man in the street's actions. Nobody is even pretending that's what's going on anymore. So the policy toolkit has become very big, very unwieldy. The problem being dealt with is huge because trying to keep financial markets under wraps when the economy is structurally weak but then goes through the sort of cyclical weakness that we all experience in, in Q1 to Q2 of last year, of course, incredibly, incredibly difficult. And I think when you get into that technical toolkit, the fact that, that Madame Lagarde's background is not, um, you know, from a sort of theoretical economics perspective, is not a career central banker, obviously that means that she has to come up the learning curve a little. And, and obviously she's doing that and she, I think she's getting better through time. Um, but in trying to say nothing, to not give the market anything to go on, which I think is what she aims to do in most press conferences, she quite often uh, confuses more than she clarifies. And we've seen this, this pattern of, of the chief economist, Philip Lane, issuing these, um, these blog posts in the day after the meeting, I think, to try and fine tune and clarify some of that message. Do you think we need a little bit more structure in the communication, James? What is it that we need? What we have seen from the Federal Reserve is a shift in the reaction function, a new framework. And whether you think that's the right or wrong thing, what it has done is it's forced pretty much every single member of the FOMC right now to sing from the same hymn sheet. You don't get that in Europe. We didn't get that in Draghi's tenure either. Do we need more structure? You know, my honest answer to this, John, is we need less, not more. I think, Interesting. you know, go, go back 40 years and, and there was no announcement, there was no statement, there was nothing. There was a, a, few, a few men in a smoky room and then you had to look at money markets to work out what decision had been made, if any, at all. Now, that's one extreme. I think we're way at the other end of the spectrum. I think... Yeah, ultimately, central bankers need to understand that they cannot manage every short-term gyration of financial markets. And to the extent that they do, they are creating as many problems for themselves when they try and exit policy as they're solving as they implement policy. And I think this is one of the things we're about to experience here. 
this is something that Richard Koo wrote about many years ago and has been very consistent on, and he's been very accurate in understanding and describing the world post post the GFC, the QE trap. And this, this is the point that is very easy to ratchet up the amount of policy that's implemented to deal with every, uh, every whips or every decline yeah. in economic activity. But actually, it's much more difficult to then try and deal with financial markets overreacting, overextrapolating when you come to exit the policy. And I think central banks possibly, and possibly this includes the ECB, certainly the Hawks, they're just trying not to dig themselves into a deeper hole just yet, not until they absolutely have to. James, as an investor, what could happen in today's press conference that could actually make you change the way you invest or what you decide to buy? I mean, yeah, on a tactical time horizon, Lisa, obviously there can be portfolio changes as a result of things that you hear. I wouldn't expect that to be the case today. What I might expect is that some prices might change that become more attractive to change investments. Um, I think, you know, broadly speaking, bond yields are under pressure everywhere. I think the next phase of the sort of bond market um, tr economic cycle, bond market transition, if you like, is for the rest of the world, the non-US, non-China world, to play some economic catch-up. And I think that probably sees yields outside of the U.S. underperforming relative to the, the U.S. I think when you see yields rising, I don't think that's a great place for Italy to be, especially if there's any whiff of taper talk. And so if we, we were to see a, a very successful dovish message from, from Madame Lagarde and we see Italian yields fall and spreads tighten, that might be something I would look to lean into. Based on the fact that not a lot has changed from the headlines we've seen just now at 12.45, I think, you know, Madame Lagarde, again, is going to hope that this, this presser is a bit of a snooze fest. But to your <laughs> point, John, she's going to get she's going to get asked a snooze lot of questions said. about this. <laughs> Some, someone I got asked. in trouble for saying that once upon a time, James. James, James, oh. it's going to be, I'm on the edge of my seat. I mean, this, I'm taking notes and it's going to, you know, we'll have it on radio James can for come back well. tomorrow, the day after. Got, we'll do it on I've a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to be honest with you. This is the bit of the job that I probably enjoy the least. Pouring selling over the it, James. You're selling it, James. Keep it up. <laughs> You're not alone, James. You're not alone, though. James Athick, no. Aberdeen Standard Investment Senior James, Investment you. Manager. Real time. Yeah. I say technical, and Tom, you're right. You call it boring. James Athy does too, and for many yeah. people it might well, be. We'll see. In you about know, 40 minutes' time. Well, and we'll have our experts on at T Live, of course, covering every nuance of the ECB meeting. John, Rich Greenfield is always entertaining. He's out with a 37% up price target on Pinterest. Can I just say I still don't get it? I still it? don't get it. Lisa, do you get it? Lisa, well, do you get I still it? Don't it's get working it. with Shopify a little bit more to advertise small businesses. So perhaps that's going to give it a boost. But you get the platform. Not really. No, I still don't I get it. But I'm not in Clubhouse, we, so what do I get? Should, should we, we be that doing, <laughs> should <laughs> should we be doing Andrew Pinterest? Andrew Sheets next of Morgan Stanley <laughs> Thank and you. the President of the United States just around the corner to on, Pinterest. on Earth Day with Tom Keane. What more do you want from life? This is Bloomberg. just been hugely stress tested here right with this bond deal tantrum and so the market sort of survived clearly the market is going to have to navigate this transition from incredible monetary accommodation to thinking about what removing some of that accommodation is ultimately going to look like where policy stance is today needs to be seen through but absolutely there are some tough decisions ahead labor market healing is going to be a key component to our 2021 and 2022 forecasts we still have the long-term structural forces that weigh against significant acceleration and growth. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen, a simulcast on Bloomberg Radio, on Bloomberg Television. In this hour, Andrew Sheets to join us from Morgan uh, Stanley. We may get comments from our Martin Shanker. And John, in this hour, we're joined by the President of the United States. And the President of the ECB as well. The President of the United States, due to speak in the next couple of minutes, Tom, will get the opening remarks at the very global climate summit that kicks off this morning. The Vice President speaking first. We'll take those comments from the President of the United States. Top of the press release from the administration this morning on these new greenhouse gas reduction targets. Tom, good paying union 
jobs. This is a big domestic push, not just an international well, speaking one. speaking to the domestic push and also the reaffirmation of emissions, but, John, it seems to me that this is a reaffirmation of pre-Trump climate change in America. How do they do that without making it obvious? Reaffirming that and re-upping it as well and trying to reclaim some credibility on an issue that they lost some maybe a lot more in the view of many people in the previous four years, Tom. Lisa, what will you listen for from the president? How he's going to sell the jobs aspect of this. We've been talking all morning about how there's sort of two prongs to this that are somewhat in conflict. The domestic story, that basically this will bring investment back to the U.S. and can create better jobs and better competition for uh, the U.S. And then the international story, basically the world needs help and it will help us all. Well, I'm wondering what kind of teeth he has behind it, what kind of money and where it's going to go. And where the money is going to be federal, state, or from corporations, as we heard from Mark Carney yesterday uh, with his efforts on climate change. We've decided, of course, on surveillance to give some good coverage to this this morning. Uh, John, it's something off the Paris Agreement and maybe the reaffirmation of climate change off the last four years, but it does dovetail into the economics of the moment, and that's Christine Lagarde at the bottom of the hour. Well, let's talk about the economics of the moment for that central bank, Tom, and let's talk about the bond buying program. In about 30 minutes' time, the ECB president is going to get peppered with questions about the bond buying program. You told us you would front load the buying in this quarter. What does that mean? Is that what we've already seen? And that doesn't look like front loading to us. Expect a lot of questions on that. Might be boring to some people, but it matters yeah. to this bond market. If you lose credibility now, what does that mean when things get a little bit more stressful? On the data front right now, I'm going to call it a churn to the market. Let's look at the euro 120.44 with those many calls uh, looking up to 125. Because of the time and as we wait for the vice president and a movie to be played and then we will bring you the president of the United States, we need to get caught up on the finance of the moment. There's no one better to do that with than Andrew Sheets with Morgan Stanley and their chief cross asset strategist. Andrew, good morning to you. The milieu here is a boom American economy. Economy. How does your view change on allocation, given the strength of the American locomotive? Well, I think that that's a great place to start. Uh, the growth backdrop appears incredibly strong. Our economists at Morgan Stanley uh, have continued to hold an above consensus view on, on both U.S. and global growth. So we're certainly in that strong growth camp. But I also think we have to acknowledge that this unusually fast recovery could mean we also have an unusually fast cycle, an unusually short cycle. And thus, it's time for investors to start moving out of many of the strategies, many of the sectors that often work in that early cycle right after a recession period into things that tend to work better when conditions get a little bit more mid-cycle, when that recovery is a little bit more mature. And so those are the rotations that we're starting to make, um, switching out of small caps into large caps, moving into more quality stocks. I, I think that's going to be an important theme as, yes, growth is very strong, but I think we could be facing a cycle that looks much hotter and, and much faster than those that we're used to. Andrew, I want you to build on that because I think it's lost on some people still. You've been pushing this story now for the best part of a couple of months, I think. The shorter, hotter cycle. What are the signposts you're using right now to suggest that this cycle will be shorter, it will be hotter? Yeah, great. So I, I think it's it's fascinating because it's really kind of three overlapping cycles. There's economic conditions, there are business confidence conditions, and then there are market conditions. And if we think about the, the cycle, that kind of cyclical movement in, in very simple terms, it's about going from the low depressed levels to high elevated levels. And for the economy, it's about how quickly do you go back above trend in inflation? How quickly are you below average in unemployment? Well, those things, I think, will happen unusually fast. That's that's the view of Ellen Zentner, our chief U.S. economist. For businesses, it's about moving from caution to aggression. It's about high corporate confidence coming back. Well, you know, you see this in in business confidence surveys that those are rapidly improving, and we think they'll continue to improve. And and on markets, you're seeing it in valuations where you know market valuations have have already returned to kind of cyclical peaks in many cases, unusually fast. So I think those are just some of the signposts that we're watching, but I think all of that is consistent with a, a progression that's happening much faster than what investors have been used to over the last 30 years. Andrew, have equities, have risk assets already priced in the peak of this hotter and shorter cycle? 
I think in some cases they, they have. Uh, I think in, in some, if you look at, you know, what we're forecasting for the S&P 500, you know, my colleague Mike Wilson has a 3,900 target for the end of this year. So we're, we're above that. I think it's it's fair to say we think U.S. equities have priced in a lot of good news. Um, credit spreads are, are kind of near cyclical tights, um, near near our forecasts again for the end of the year. So again, a market that we think is priced in a lot. And on the interest rate front, you know, we think that you know inflation break evens have generally hit our team's targets. We we had been more optimistic that those break evens would move higher, and and we now think that that is that needs to pause. So there are some key movements there. I would say one market that we think has not priced in, um, you know, where there is still risk premium is an EM local debt. Uh, if one at FX hedges it, that's a market we've recently upgraded on the emerging market side. And that's one area where I still think there's some value. Andrew Sheeter, Morgan Stanley with us this morning as we await comments, opening remarks from the President of the United States at a global climate change summit. The Vice President, Kamala Harris, speaking right now. Andrew, let me just turn to the domestic story in America. You're looking at peak growth in the United States. Does that mean one thing for the equity market and something else for the bond market? Do those two asset classes read into that differently? Well, I, I think there's potentially because I, I do think the bond market is directly linked or will be heavily influenced by what the Federal Reserve does, where I think the equity market will be influenced by both the Fed, but also the progression of earnings and, and a number of other factors. And, you know, I think the key issue on the equity side, you know, this was a, a component of, of my colleague Mike Wilson's downgrade of the small cap market is, you know, just concern that the margin picture is going to start to get more complicated, that um, you have costs that are rising in the supply chain, and those costs um, are not going to be equally easy to pass on to end, uh, end customers, and we think it will be harder for some of those kind of smaller, lower quality companies to do so. So now I think of the bond market side, you've seen a bond market that's already pricing in a, a near-term path that we think is more hawkish than what yep. the Fed would like to do, and, and so that's a somewhat different picture. Hey, Andrew, I want to do a couple of things. Stay close. We'll come back to you in just a moment. Andrew Sheets there of Morgan Stanley, the President of the United States addressing the world on climate change. Let's take a listen. More than preserving our planet. It's also about, it's also providing, about providing a better, providing a better, future, better future, for future for all of us. That's why that's when why people when talk, people about, talk climate, about climate, I think, I think jobs. jobs. Within our climate, Within our climate response, response lies an extraordinary, lies an extraordinary, extraordinary engine, engine of job creation and economic, and economic opportunity, opportunity ready to be, ready fired, to be up. fired up. That's why, that's I, why I proposed, proposed a huge, huge investment in American infrastructure, American infrastructure and American and innovation. innovation. To tap the economic opportunity that climate change presents our world. A, a, a critical infrastructure to produce and deploy clean technology, both those we can harness today and those that we'll invent tomorrow. I talk to the experts and I see the potential for a more prosperous and equitable future. The signs are unmistakable. The science is undeniable. But the cost of inaction is keeps mounting. The United States isn't waiting. We are resolving to take action. Not only the, our federal government, but our cities and our states all across our country. Small businesses, large businesses, large corporations, American workers in every field. I see an opportunity to create millions of good paying middle class union jobs. I see line workers laying thousands of miles of transmission lines for a clean, modern, resilient grid. I see workers capping hundreds of thousands of abandoned oil and gas wells that need to be cleaned up and abandoned coal mines that need to be reclaimed, putting a stop to the methane leaks and protecting the health of our communities. I see auto workers building the next generation of electric vehicles and electricians installing nationwide for 500,000 charging stations along our highways. I see engi the engineers and the construction workers building new carbon capture and green hydrogen plants to forge cleaner steel and cement and produce clean power. I see farmers deploying cutting edge tools to make soil of our, of our heartland the next frontier in carbon innovation. By maintaining those investments, and putting these people to work, the United States sets out on the road to cut a greenhouse gases in half, in half by the end of this decade. That's where we're headed as a nation. And that's what we can do if we take action to build an economy that's not only more prosperous, but healthier, fairer, and cleaner for the entire planet. You know, these steps 
will set America on a path of net zero emissions economy by no later than 2050. But the truth is, America represents less than 15 percent of the world's emissions. No nation can solve this crisis on our own, as I know you all fully understand. All of us, all of us, and particularly those of us who represent the world's largest economies, we have to step up. You know, those that do take action and make bold investments in their people and clean energy future will win the good jobs of tomorrow and make their economies more resilient and more competitive. So let's run that race, win more, win more sustainable future than we have now, overcome the existential crisis of our times. We know just how critically important that is because scientists tell us that this is the decisive decade. This is the decade we must make decisions that will avoid the worst consequences of the climate crisis. We must try to keep the Earth's temperature and to an increase of to 1.5 degrees Celsius. You know, the world beyond 1.5 degrees means more frequent and intense fires, floods, droughts, heat waves, and hurricanes, tearing through communities, ripping away lives and livelihoods. Increasingly, dire impacts to our public health. It's undeniable, non you know, the idea of accelerating and punishing the reality that will come if we don't move. We can't resign ourselves to that future. We have to take action, all of us. And this summit is our first step on the road. We'll travel together, God willing, all of us, to and through Glasgow this November and the UN Climate Conference, the Climate Change Conference. You know, to set our world on a path to secure, prosperous, and sustainable future. The health of communities throughout the world depends on it. The well-being of our workers depends on it. The strength of our economies depends on it. The countries that take decisive action now to create the industries of the future will be the ones that reap the economic benefits of the clean energy boom that's coming. You know, we're here at this summit to discuss how each of us, each country, can set higher climate ambitions that will in turn create good paying jobs, advance innovative technologies, and help vulnerable countries adapt to climate impacts. We have to move. We have to move quickly to meet these challenges. The steps our countries take between now and Glasgow will set the world up for success to protect livelihoods around the world and keep global warming at a maximum of 1.5 degrees Celsius. We must get on the path now in order to do that. If we do, we'll breathe easier, literally and figuratively. We'll create good jobs here at home for millions of Americans and lay a strong foundation for growth for the future. And, and that, that can be your goal as well. This is a moral imperative an economic imperative, a moment of peril, but also a moment of extraordinary possibilities. Time is short, but I believe we can do this. And I believe that we will do this. Thank you for being part of this summit. Thank you and for the communities that you uh, and the commitments you have made and the communities you're from. God bless you all. And I look forward to progress that we can make together today and beyond. We really have no choice. We have to get this done. That was the President of the United States kicking off the Virtual Leaders Summit on climate. The President addressing that summit, saying they're on a path to net zero emissions by 2050 here in the United States, re-upping, renewing, and also increasing some of the goals here in America. Tom, a clear focus on this speech, jobs. It was a word he used continuously as he addressed international leaders, good-paying jobs, moving from one industry and transitioning workers to another. We have to step up and win the good jobs of tomorrow, take decisive action now to to reap the benefits of the revolution that's coming. And it is such a difference, John. I think what we really, we have to look back at the last four years and compare and contrast presidential tone and presidential quote. And what I heard there, John, was the, is President Biden mentioned, it's a first step for him to change the rhetoric. What I heard was an outreach to international leaders, simultaneously yes. also, Tom, a message for the domestic economy as well. You're going to hear a whole lot more about good-paying, middle-class 
union jobs from this president. And clearly a key piece of that puzzle is the climate push. Absolutely. Martin Schenker with us, our editor-at-large, managing editor here of all that we do. Marty, uh, the president, to Neil Cavuto, this would be President Trump from a few years ago, talking about the con that is global warming. There's never been an abrupt change like this, has there? No, and it's not lost on world leaders, and it's uh, that, you know, in <clears throat> four years you can get another complete change of attitude on climate. So where is the U.S. credibility on this issue long term um, is, is the question. Also, Marty, President Biden coming out and saying that this kicks off a race for the best jobs, that the countries that are the first movers in being more aggressive in, uh, in combating climate change will be the ones rewarded with the better jobs. What kind of push, what kind of muscle is Biden putting behind this from the United States, given the lack of bipartisan support behind some of this green spending? Well, Lisa, you put your finger right on the issue. Um, the uh, emission targets are quite aggressive, uh, double what Obama's were, um, but you're not going to get this done voluntarily. There needs to be legislation requirements that are going to cause pain as well as opportunity in the economy. And getting politicians to agree on, on, on regulations that change behavior is going to be exceedingly difficult. When he talks about jobs, which jobs is, are he, is he talking about? Is he talking about solar and wind uh, power plant operators? Is he talking about uh, researchers, about electric batteries? I mean, how wholesale is this? Can we sort of quantify it in any way? I, I don't know that we can. Um, you know, he laid out in his speech just there that he sees many of these jobs being union jobs. Um, so, the, you know, he would like to see them uh, actually build things like, you know, charging stations across the country. Um, but the key issue is how is how are you going to get that done through a Congress that is sharply divided? Well, this is the issue, isn't it, Marty? Because the president moved the goalpost recently and said he wants to unite the country, not unite Congress. On this issue, does he need to unite Congress? I think he absolutely does. And, I, you know, it, there are pockets of Republicans who acknowledge that this is something that needs to be addressed, but the question is how. Um, the public certainly thinks that climate change is an important issue that needs to get some government response. Getting all those things to work together in a common way is going to be his his task and and that of you know his cabinet and and Pete Buttigieg will play a large role in that. Marty, a defining moment for this administration, that's for sure. The beginning of one, anyway. Marty Schenker, there, Bloomberg editor at large. Tom, Secretary Blinken, coming out. Here's a headline for you: The Biden administration will do more than any other on climate. I, John, I look at the quotes. I, I, I'm going to circle back to this, John. I know I sound like a broken record, but this is an administration that not only has to create trust, but has to create the hardest thing, which is sustained, deep, penetrating trust. And it's really hard to do in this first effort. That goes beyond this administration, which yeah. is the key point you're alluding to. This has ramifications, implications, and consequences for investors, too. This came from Bank of America on Earth Day today. They say it pays to be green. We see higher multiples for low emissions, net zero targets and water efficiency, higher multiples yeah. on companies that are leading that drive. Tom, I want to turn to Andrew Sheets on this of Morgan Stanley, chief cross-asset strategist. This is unavoidable now for investors, Andrew. Can you walk me through how you're approaching this issue? Yeah, so I, I think something that's really important to how we're thinking about this from Morgan Stanley is something you saw the president come back to again and again there, which is investment, right? This is a huge structural investment theme, maybe one of the biggest investment themes that the U.S. and the world is going to face over the next 30 years. And, you know, it's fascinating. It wasn't more than five years ago when investors everywhere were really worried about a lack of investment, that you know, we were entering this world where there just wasn't enough investment spending. There was, you know, a structural shift in CapEx and that that was driving kind of major problems for the global economy. Well, you know, kind of the green transition across a number of industries, huge secular theme. And, you know, you look at something like the utilities industry, uh, a sector that's often seen a little bit sleepy, a little bit boring, huge transitions going on there in some companies, benefiting some companies, not benefiting others. But I think, you know, those are areas where you can see, in some cases, very interesting multi-decade runways of investment, of greening of the business. Um, and those yeah. things, I think, have very significant implications for investors. Andrew Sheets, where does Morgan Stanley 
on ESG, see in America, where five years and four months ago, our president conflated his hairspray with the ozone hole in the Antarctic. How does Morgan Stanley see the United States advancing forward on ESG as we come out of that statement five years ago? Well, I, I think you mentioned a key point in the earlier block that this issue of commitment is um, a, an unknown question. You know, politics can change rapidly. We've seen that in the U.S. It, it could change again. And so some of this is also a question of where are the economics? And so one thing that is you know, very important, say, again, in the utilities space is that the economics of going green are very, very good. It's, it's, it's not just the environmentally the right thing to do. It's often the right thing to do from a business perspective. And that makes it very sticky. You know, that, that means you're not counting on kind of the political wins that, that you also have this other incentive driver behind it. Some of the shifts towards electric vehicles, they're not just about consumer preferences for green cars. They're, they're about the economics, the improved economics of some of these EVs and autonomous vehicles. So I think that's a very important thing to consider, both where is the political aspect of it, but also where's the economic aspect of it, because that gives it an additional push. Well, the economic aspect of it, or at least the financial one, is Tesla to the moon. Going forward, how much has already been baked in? I mean, uh, how much is sort of overpriced at this point based on near-term goals versus opportunities, areas that perhaps are not factoring in a green push? Yeah, I, I, th I think, you know, look, it's a, it's a challenging dynamic because you, you have seen huge success in many of these um, ESG-focused companies, which is, you know, great to see, but also means, you know, you have higher valuations, more stretched valuations in some places, which creates obvious challenges. So, you know, I do think it's about looking for places where maybe the, the story is a little bit less exciting, uh, but is is equally important on a long term view. Uh, again, kind of in Europe, the utility sector is one where, again, maybe not the most exciting companies, but where you have the, a, a story of multi year, maybe multi decade investment that is possible over the long run. Andrew, always good to hear from you, sir. Andrew Sheets, Morgan Stanley Chief, Cross Asset Strategist, joining us on this market. Ahead of the ECB decision, we've had that decision. The news conference, I should say, to be a little bit more precise. The President, Christine Lagarde, speaking in about seven minutes' time. Initial jobless claims coming up as well. Tom, on Earth Day, we need to talk about this. I mentioned it earlier on in the programme. Know what you own. Was it Peter Lynch that used to talk about that? Know what you own. Know what you own when it comes to this as well. BlackRock put out a carbon transition readiness ETF recently. They've got a ton of demand, a lot of inflows and money lining up to get inside it. And look at what's in that ETF. Top of the pile, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, Facebook. Maybe they are the companies that are leading the transition in the United States of America. But when people buy that ETF passively, when they allocate money to it, do they know what they own? Well, in the ETF world, I think that's dead on. And again, we go to the statistics here, John, of the R squared. What you just described is an R squared of about 0.99 to the NASDAQ. I mean, that's all there is uh, to it. I will say that the people who are long-term pro-tech are there because of the structural change in the U.S., and that folds in to ESG. And clearly, Lisa, there is a premium being attached to the companies that are making this push, which goes back to an earlier comment that I think we've all made this morning. Reg Regardless of who is in the White House, there is clearly a credibility issue with the federal government. There isn't right now with corporations in the same way, or for cities for that matter too. Yeah, but there's a difficult time quantifying what is a green push. Who's doing the best <laughs> climate initiative in terms of corporations? I think Francis Donald said one of the most interesting things this morning, which is that the way they're looking at it is countries, not companies, countries that are investing more heavily in uh, combating climate change. That is where they're looking to invest. Perhaps current are on a macroeconomic level. And yep. I wonder how much that's going to become a theme yeah. going forward, John. <clears throat> Tom? John, I want to mention here the president of China is speaking now. Mr. Xi is speaking. And of course, John, this is wrapped up in the immediate politics of climate change, but also the really interesting relationships here, not only uh, between uh, the China and the U.S., but uh, the U.S. and Russia as well. Three things on the radar through the next hour then. Initial jobless claims in America coming up next. An ECB news conference with Christine Lagarde and world leaders addressing climate change in a virtual summit from New York City this morning. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance.
from New York City for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane, Lisa Bravitz and Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures slightly negative, down almost a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. Economic data due in the United States of America. Here it is. Oh. Here's Mike McKee. Good morning, John. Well, last week we had a big surprise because of the Easter uh, distortions to jobless claims. They fell significantly. Uh, this time, they go down again. And that is good news for the economy because maybe some of the seasonal factors are working their way out of the data. 547,000 initial jobless claims. This is the kind of number we had been expecting. Last week, everybody said, well, okay, it was Easter. It's hard to seasonally adjust. And it is possible that, that some of that leaped over into this week as well or last week as well. Uh, and. Uh, we don't know yet going forward, but if we continue this kind of thing, it's going to be good. This is a decrease of 39,000 from the uh, previously revised number uh, the week before. Uh, the uh, lowest level for initial claims, they're saying, since March 14th, when it was 256,000. And that, of course, was <clears throat> the week before yeah. we started getting the amazingly high claims numbers. Michael McKee, with the Bloomberg and with all the fancy moving averages and the exponents, we can pound through it. What I'm seeing is a curvature here. We're going from convex, which is not good, to rolling over to a concave set of moving averages. Can you call a trend change here when we move from the convex to the concave? Well, you probably can. I'm going to be a little bit cautious and say, I would you know, agree, this yeah. time of year, seasonal is difficult. So let's wait another week. Have me back Fair. next Thursday. We'll talk about it. If this is the trend, though, this is what we had been expecting to see for quite some time. Claims are looking better. They need to get much better. Michael McKee, thank you. From New York to Frankfurt, Germany, we need to catch up with the president of the ECB, Christine Lagarde. Let's take a listen. 